Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Welcome to Making It Personal, Bishop Johnson. I'm Kelly Mesher Collins with the Diocese of Des Moines. On today's show, we're visiting with Mary Everstadt, who holds the Panula Chair in Christian Culture and at the Catholic Information Center in Washington, D.C. She's also a senior research fellow at the Faith and Reason Institute. We're visiting with her today about her newest book, Adam and Eve After the Pill Revisited, which investigates the sexual revolution's large scale transformation in society, politics, and Christianity. But before we get to today's interview, let's find out what's on the bishop's mind. Really looking forward to connecting with Mary, and we're actually going to bring her in yes. here on the first segment here. But uh, here we are in the Easter octave mm-hmm. and uh, those great days that will lead us to Divine Mercy Sunday this Sunday. So obviously, Sister Faustina, St. Faustina. And the, the great celebrations around the diocese there that will uh, invoke uh, our trust in Jesus and the mercy that flows from his side as he brings peace to the apostles and to us as well. It's also today kind of a signature day in the life of uh, the greater Des Moines community. It's the inauguration of President Adrian Henry as the president of Mercy College of Health Sciences. He came to us from Texas, and he's really certainly made a mark. He's not himself Catholic. Uh, he's a div- devout Christian, but uh, I think he really has grasped, and it's my privilege over the Uh, months here to interact with him. I think he's grasping what a Catholic identity and mission means and kind of trying to raise that to a new level as well. So uh, with Bo Bonner and others, I think that collaboration is great. So we'll start with a mass in the cathedral on on, uh, Friday morning. I have luncheon and then the uh, moving to the event center for the formal inauguration. And it continues into the evening. But uh, I'll excuse myself at some point because the Knights of Columbus are having their state convention uh, here in Des Moines at the Marriott downtown. And so uh, lots of all the good men who are part of that coming from far corners of the state, the four dioceses, and to converge and kind of conduct their annual affairs. But I think to draw strength from the brothers as they live in unity and the many good works that they are, certainly in supporting Ukraine, uh, you know, they're apostles of life in so many ways and the generosity for pregnancy resource centers and the many good things that they do in that way. And then I get to, here we go, confirmation season. It's time to saddle up and uh, mm-hmm. do that again. As uh, Bishop Connolly of Lincoln always says, you know, the old chrism trail, you know, we want to kind of start out on that. We'll be at St. Teresa's uh, and in Des Moines and St. Thomas Aquinas in Indianola. Uh, and then we'll be at St. Peter and Paul in Atlantic on Sunday. So, And we're also going to try to reactivate the uh, diocesan pastoral Council. That's a great initiative that kind of continues with the strategic visioning. And uh, more about that. I think, Kelly, we need to have a show about that at some point, kind of talk about that. And our time with Professor Dan Ebner of St. Ambrose, who's really guided us through these last two years. So but we'd like to welcome Mary. Mary's been waiting here patiently in the wings. And thank you, Mary. It's so good <laughs> to have you again on our show. I think it's been maybe a couple of years since you were last with us. Hope all you're doing well, a public intellectual and a woman of great faith who is uh, not afraid to kind of uh, engage uh, some of the voices maybe that are discordant in, in a certain way. So it's so great to have you, Mary. Thanks for having me again, Bishop Jensen. Yes, and we're going to focus on your book, Adam and Eve and the Pill Revisited. So 10 years after the, the previous book by that name, uh, it was really striking to me that you had Cardinal George Pell, who contributed the foreword to the book before his sudden death this past January 10th. And uh, he kind of uh, gives a, the reader a preview of your, your theme about the choice between Christianity and chaos and states your thesis very succinctly. Uh, your, your own can I, How did he come to write the foreword and, you know, this man who has uh, suffered so much in the trials and the accusations that he had to face, but the truth was ultimately outed? Yes, well, that really was the honor of a lifetime to have him contribute that foreword. I only met with him twice in person, but we corresponded apart from that. And he made such an unforgettable impression because he was the most unlikely combination of the most powerful intellect, but also the most pastoral uh, kind of approach. And it was very clear that he was into this intellectual analysis because he wanted to help people get to heaven. And it might seem self-evident that a cardinal wants to help people get to heaven. But for him, I really felt like that was the driving force. And so all in all, uh, it was really um, unforgettable to have any dealings with the cardinal. And I'm thrilled to have his foreword to the book. It was, and it's a it's so succinct but uh, penetrating in its own right. So, Mary, we look to continue the conversation here. We're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. 
Thank you to our business partner, Chip In for Charity, the St. Vincent de Paul Golf Fundraiser to Fight Hunger, Thursday, May 25th at Copper Creek Golf Course. 10 a.m. shotgun start. For registration and sponsorship opportunities, visit svdpdsm.org. Iowa Catholic Radio would like to thank our business partner, Elite Glass and Metal, LLC in Johnson, a full-service glass and glazing contractor serving Des Moines and surrounding areas, new construction, existing projects, and residential. Learn more at EliteGlassAndMetal.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio comes from businesses and organizations who share in the mission of connecting listeners to Christ while connecting you to their products and services they provide. To learn more and support the businesses and organizations who support the Iowa Catholic Radio Network, visit iowacatholicradio.com to view our business sponsors. If you'd like more information on how your business or organization can become a business sponsor, contact Deacon Mark, 515-223-1150, 515-223-1150. Welcome back to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. On today's show, we're visiting with Mary Eberstadt, who holds a Panula Chair in Christian Culture at the Catholic Information Center in Washington, D.C. She's also a Senior Research Fellow at the Faith and Reason Institute. We're talking about our newest book, Adam and Eve, After the Pill Revisited, which investigates the sexual revolution's transformation in society, politics, and Christianity. So again, Mary, thank you for gracing us with some time here. Uh, your your writing is always so accessible, I think, to a broader audience in a way, and uh, you know, I think speaks to us even as you are advancing arguments and uh, even kind of acknowledge that at points when you make reference to syllogisms and things like that. But uh, uh, you, you, the research in the book, you know, it's always documented very well. But uh, your husband Nicholas, uh, with whom I'm privileged to to break bread on occasion, you thank him in the book and many others for their support. But he himself, a political economist and a keen observer of demographic data and trends, do you two, is this stuff that you talk about over the dining room table, or does this come up in any other ways? (laughs) Thank you, Bishop. That is the first time in my life I've ever been asked that question. You know, the truth is that Nick and I have never collaborated on anything uh, formally, by which I mean we don't co-author uh, together, I, I guess we collaborated on having a family, which is a pretty big thing. Uh, but it has, of course, <laughs> been one of the blessings of my life that I'm married to this brilliant man, and I get to check some of my thoughts by him. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, raising a family—that's kind of the thesis of the book, right? <laughs> that this is a really good thing to raise a family. So, and uh, something that obviously our, our society suffers when families don't flourish in this way. Um, one of the ways in which you make it personal very early on in talking about cultural changes, you draw from your own experience, kind of going back to your own native upstate New York region. Uh, do you think that's a, a nice anecdote that you, that you had there that kind of illustrates what's going on on a broader scale? I do, Bishop. I was trying to come up with an anecdote that would get across as an illustration just how much the sexual revolution has affected the world. And so I grew up in a series of small towns and hamlets in rural upstate New York, very rural. And the story that I tell in the book... Which will appear to our listeners on making it personal in the southwest Iowa and western Nebraska. Sorry (laughs) to interrupt you. Thank you. No, no, not at all. (laughs) So the story that I tell is of... Uh, starts in the early 1970s when a, a girl in town got pregnant and it turned out that her boyfriend wouldn't marry her. And this caused a great scandal at the time because although teenage pregnancy was not unknown, single motherhood then was very, very unusual. Then 20 years later, I went back to the town and was visiting with a teacher, a high school teacher of mine. And she told me that at that time, a third of the girls in the graduating class were pregnant. So in that snapshot, I think we can see how the sexual revolution really caught fire and transformed not only rural upstate New York, but a lot of the country. And it seemed to me a good illustration of the thesis. And and so with no cultural expectation that the, the fathers for these uh, pregnant teenagers would step up and take any responsibility or that, they're, you know, that they had an obligation to, to do uh, right by their, their girlfriends. Yeah, that's exactly what changed. And in the book, I talk about the work of some perfectly secular economists trying to understand this. But basically, the idea is that the shotgun wedding disappeared that with the adoption of contraception across much of society, 
the marketplace was flooded with available partners, potentially, and it meant that there was no longer stigma attached to not taking responsibility for pregnancy. Right, which is not to be an advocate for shotgun weddings, and I think most priest pastors would say, well, just because someone, a couple presents themselves as pregnant well before marriage at a young age, that that's not going to be something we're going to try and encourage them, but hopefully to kind of see and discern and mature a little bit before that ultimate commitment. But that that there is already a commitment uh, to be uh, a supporter and to accompany, as our Holy Father would say, in that way. You talk about this dynamic between the sexes and and how men have... uh, kind of been, many have been kind of cast into perpetual adolescence, and some of the terms you use are, are pretty vivid in that regard. Uh, terms like manolescent and so boy and the prisoner's dilemma that women face. How do these terms kind of serve your overall uh, thesis of your book? Well, the problem is that without responsibility, without uh, living a life of sacrifice, there is no reason to grow up. And this is what we see. We see in our society, uh, a proliferation of these terms like Peter Pan syndrome or failure to launch or soy boy, etc. These are all pointing to the same phenomenon, which is that there is no longer a strong incentive for young men to get married, raise a family, perform the sacrificial life that that requires. And so that's part of what I'm trying to get at in the book, is trying to understand what happened to all that. Indeed. And uh, and this this manifests itself in a most uh, conspicuous way uh, in, in terms of the Black Lives Movement uh, you know, movement and uh, and some of the th- dynamics were there, right, with regard to, to single parenthood and the, uh, the abdication of or the absence of, of fathers in the lives of, of young men and, and women. I think the absence of fathers is critical to understanding the world today. It is not only the earthly father who is often missing in these homes. It's also, of course, the idea of a heavenly father. So you have people who have been robbed simultaneously of these two kinds of paternity. And I think a lot of the social unrest that we see is a result of that. You know, it's very interesting, getting back to Black Lives Matter, In the manifesto that that group wrote before they took it down from the Internet, um, there was a lot of talk about, uh, or sorry, against the heteronormative family. And there was talk of parents, but not of fathers. So I think what's happening is that people are trying to normalize what cannot be normalized, which is the absence of paternity. Uh, indeed, and, and you know, encounter the dad. I think a, a friendly voice for us in the Des Moines area, in the Des Moines diocese, uh, himself a Muslim uh, representative, Akko Abdul Samad of the Iowa State Legislature, at one of the early Black Lives Matter r- rallies on the, the west steps of the Capitol, at which I went to be present and just to see and to hear what, what the message was. He was a, a, a kind of a, a striking voice, you know, calling men to be men. And calling them to be there, to be present in their families, to be present to their children and the woman, whether they're married or not. And so I was that was one of my takeaways there that I don't think that, unfortunately, that that was a, a theme that then got woven into the larger movement. In fact, quite the quite the contrary along the way. Um, you know, so many things in the book and and the book brings together uh, different uh, facets of, of things that you addressed and some talk separate and things. But there is a, a real coherent uh, thread that runs through all of this. You, you talk about the, the sexual revolution, uh, bringing a kind of revelation, you know, in quotation marks of a new secularist quasi religious faith and uh, how it comes. It becomes its own dogma. What are you talking about there? Well, the sexual revolution, I think, has given rise to a new faith, and we see this in all kinds of ways. We see it in the absolutism uh, with which some people defend abortion, for example. Why, Why can't we draw a line somewhere on this thing? Well, no, they say it has to be up until the moment of birth. That kind of absolutism is not your usual give and take, you know, the usual political bargaining. It's something else. It's coming out of a kind of belief system that is as powerful uh, to those believers as Christianity. And I think we see this in other ways, too. I get into this in the book, as you know. 
there are figures associated with the sexual revolution, um, like um, Margaret Sanger and Alfred Kinsey, people who said that actually the old Christian rule book was wrong and we should have a whole new way of living and it should be centered on uh, sex, um, et cetera. I'm, of course, I'm, I'm putting this as vanilla as I can. <laughs> uh, but these people... Um, their scholarship has been called into question many times. Margaret Sanger's racism has been pointed to many times, and yet they are never really dethroned in the minds of people who regard them as important. Now, why is that? It's because in their quasi-theology, these people are the equivalent of secular saints. And in one particular chapter in the book, I get into these parallels, these eerie parallels between Christian belief and this new kind of Gnostic belief that has risen up since the 1960s. Yeah, and uh, and you you flush it out with some some detail, which uh, you know with delicacy to our listeners, but again, I think uh, very appropriate for mature readers and things, and I think also for adolescent readers really to see. You know, because uncritically, if they're just watching movies about Kinsey or something, you know, his abuse and his misogyny and uh, really his uh, domination of his uh, his uh, assistants and things in a way that uh, if it were clergy, <laughs> oh, my goodness, you know, the scandal that would uh, result from that in a way. You, you Kind of a nice way of framing it, you talk about cultural developments as acts of human subtraction and how this leads to these kind of sequelae of, of loneliness and isolation, which, uh, you know, that's the, the kind of spiritual pandemic, I think, that persists. Yes, exacerbated by the, uh, the biological pandemic that we've been through, but uh, these things were long in germination and, and will be with us long after uh, the, uh, COVID has subsided to a kind of a more innocuous level. What do we mean by the acts of human subtraction? Well, this, I think, is very important to understand, because sooner or later, there won't be anyone left on this earth who doesn't remember life before the sexual revolution. So we really need to understand what it has done. If you look at the various uh, trends that the revolution sparked, the rise in fatherlessness, for example, the rise in abortion, divorce, broken homes, smaller families, etc., Every single one of these, without being judgmental at all, every single one of these is an act of human subtraction. It's an act that takes other people out of people's lives. And so I believe what this means is that we are living in ways that are very unnatural to the kind of creatures that we are. We are like other animals in a, in a profound sense. We need each other. And in the book, I get into a little bit of the animal science because animals in the wild do not live on their own. They live in families, extended families, networks, etc., so that they can have good social organization, social learning, whatever. Well, we are not that different at a fundamental level, and yet we are performing this experiment on ourselves where we've atomized people and taken people out of people's lives in a way that I think we're seeing the results of, and the results are not good. We right now are in a moment of record levels of drug addiction in the United States. Now, if prolonged adolescence and the failure to have families were making people happy, I don't think we would be seeing things like this. And so that's the kind of proof that I point to when I talk about the damages of the sexual revolution that are not widely acknowledged but need to be. And, and it strikes me that how uh, b the, both the biological and sociological substrate on a natural level, how this maps so well, and obviously God's providential wisdom you know, the, the, the identity of God on a theological level of relationality and how that's ingredient to God and how for us then to, to realize that uh, both as uh, creatures created according to the flesh, but also spiritual beings who have that and that, that, that these must be, uh, uh, you know, integrated and uh, essentially united in, in who we are. Um, you, you, you can further continue that, uh, you know, some of the ways in which you know, these causes for secularization, and you debunk some of those, and even some that I would have probably thought were part of the, the mix for this. But this principal variable accounting for a person's degree of religiosity 
and the way that uh, that might uh, contribute to then the the great rise of the nuns, the N O N E S uh, generation that uh, you know not only is uh, uh, dismissive of, of baby boomers and Karens in our culture, but uh, of religious faith. Yes, I think the loss of a supernatural father has been catastrophic. And here's one reason why. If you're a Christian, you're taught that your fellow human beings are your brothers and sisters in a very meaningful sense. And so not only have many people had brothers and sisters taken out of their earthly lives, but also they've lost that relationality that you described, Bishop, uh, to the people around them that can be found in church. And I don't think this is an irreversible loss, but I do think it's a consequence of the breakup of the family that is not well understood and needs to be. And so the presence of of, of earthly fathers, parents, uh, you know, again, we all understand and we all have experienced relatives, siblings, you know, who've gone through divorce and, and broken families. So that's, you know, we look upon with great compassion. This is not to be harsh in that judgment. But the but the sadness we feel, and we know that the the yoke and the challenges that poses, that's disclosive of something, a deeper truth about us and our identity as human beings, created for a relation with each other in an intimate way as a kind of school of, of, of development in, in all that we're about. We're going to head quickly here to a break, but, uh, you know, I think we want to come around to some good news as well, too, you know, but the those kind of filial attachments, not only of faith and family, but then of all of our country too, and society, and the kind of cultural chaos. And you do propose some some remedies and some things that I think can help uh, in a salutary way bring us back. So Kelly, uh, I think uh, Mary's uh, listened to me ramble here for thirty seconds, but we want to come back. All right, we're going to take a quick break. You're listening to Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio is provided by the Sarah Vocations Ministry, including the St. Sarah Club of Des Moines and the Sarah Club of Council Bluffs. Sarah is an apostolate of the Worldwide Catholic Church dedicated to fostering and supporting priesthood and religious vocations. Sarans strive to accomplish their mission through prayer, fellowship, and service to the bishop, priests, sisters, and all in religious formation, and in doing so to increase their own holiness. Learn more at joinsarah.org, join S-E-R-R-A.org. Thank you, Sarans, for your support of Iowa Catholic Radio. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio comes from CTO. Your contribution to CTO helps families send their children to our Catholic schools who otherwise could not afford it. In giving to CTO, you receive the best tax credits ever. Pledge or donate online at ctoiowa.org. ctoiowa.org. The bottom line, it's for the kids and their future. Welcome back to Making Personal with Bishop Johnson. We are back with Mary Eberstadt, author of the book, Adam and Eve, After the Pill Revisited. And again, this is a fairly compact book. It runs about 180 pages, but so incisive. And, and yes, the, the critiques that are given and the, the evidence that's there to back up the, the arguments you make as well. But uh, Mary, we're, we're interested, you know, both in the book and just in general. What are some things that, that give you hope and the things that uh, this is not just in a kind of book that's negative in a way, but is holding up to us something that can stir us and rouse us, you know, in the, in the light of Easter, you know, to live and to believe that the, the, the Holy Spirit's continuing to, to be with us to transform our culture in a, in a solitary way. Well, thank you, Bishop. I want to say first that I did write the book for the general reader, and there are a lot of footnotes for scholars, if scholars want to look into them. But I'm trying to get across a message that I think is important for all of us as Catholics. There are many reasons for hope out there. And one of them is the growth of these countercultural institutions. So when I was in college, for example, there were no Christian groups on campus. But now we have FOCUS, the Fellowship of Catholic University Students, that's on over 100 campuses. We have the Dominicans who have set up to mystic circles on every Ivy League campus and many others. So there are these signs of young people especially wanting to know about Christianity, wanting a deeper understanding of their faith. And again, these signs were not there 20, 30 years ago. So I think that's all to the good. And just to insert there, as many know in our state, that, uh, you know, the judicial ratification of, you know, the the Christian group on the campus in the University of Iowa, which was being accused and excluded, you know, based that Mm -hmm. that they were hateful or in some way just for living according to Christmas Christian principles. So, you know, it hits home for us as well. So please continue, Mary. Well, so we do need the scholarship to change people's minds. But also I'm very mindful that, 
uh, spiritual history and great moments in spiritual history seem to turn most of the time on very ordinary people. So the example of Juan Diego is always before us that way. And his act of faith and obedience that revolutionized the, the religious culture of Mexico and brought Catholicism to many millions of people. This is a very important example because it means that sometimes just saying yes and just being a witness accomplishes more in the way of conversion than all the words in the world. And I realize it's self-defeating for a book author to be talking this way, but I think the spiritual point is the one that I would like to leave people with, that witnesses uh, are needed as well as teachers. Indeed, and, and you do refer to Archbishop Gomez kind of characterizing her age as comparable to that time in the 15th, uh, 16th century, Juan Diego and things. And so all the, all the more vivid for me after my visit to the, the, the shrine in February. So and just uh, the impact that that's had and it continues to hold on uh, popular consciousness in that country, but also our own people in our Des Moines diocese, many of whom uh, come to us from, from these different places. Uh, and the significance of some of these marvelous churches, you know, we think of Chartres Cathedral, it rose up from the ashes. And so we didn't start the fire, but uh, we can respond to the fire in, in, in this. And uh, even some other movements, and I think we're trying to collaborate more. You know, obviously, I'm a great proponent of parochial education and the sponsorship, you know, and uh, education savings accounts, which was passed by our governor and the legislature. Uh, but the, these other homeschooling hybrid models of education that I think maybe correlate with some of the things you were seeing happening on higher education, Mary, what's your take on, on some of these movements? Are they, are they countercultural? Are they going to kind of be pockets that uh, isolate themselves from a larger church, or do you have hope that this can advance the, the larger body of the faithful? No, I don't think they are isolated pockets. To the contrary, I think in another hopeful development, the parents of America are starting to wake up and wonder what their kids are learning, and they're starting to take some ownership of that, whether it's through homeschooling or the other experiments that you mentioned. And again, I think this is all to the good and an, another a uh, hopeful sign that we can point to. And finally, there is also the Dobbs decision by the Supreme Court. That is a very important thing, because ever since the sexual revolution started, we've been told that it's inevitable, that there's no turning back, that there's no going back to the 1950s, and et cetera. Indeed, and Mary, and we, could, back in the bottle. and we could elaborate yeah. on that, and that will be for another show for us. But uh, <laughs> you yourself, Mary, are a sign of hope to us and, and uh, a clarion voice amidst so many chaotic voices. So thank you and blessings on your work and your family. Thank you, Bishop Johnson. Thank you so much, Mary. This has been another edition of Making It Personal with Bishop Johnson. You can hear Making It Personal with Bishop William Johnson every week on Iowa Catholic Radio and iowacatholicradio.com. Support for Iowa Catholic Radio and Making It Personal is provided by Sarah Vocations Ministry. Learn more at joinserra.org.